Would you like to respond? Of course, but I just want to say first, um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here, and also just say, Commissioner McDowell, you know, we all agreed we only want to talk for five minutes, but, you know, I could spend 25 minutes responding to your very provocative speech. I thought it was really terrific, uh, and uh, really appreciate you being here. So uh, I'm going to make three very quick points about why conservatives should like net neutrality. But before I do, and then I want to address one or two things that uh, Commissioner McDowell talked about. But before I do, let me describe what net neutrality is very briefly, okay? And, and, and I think it is simple. And, and the way folks like Kyle like to mess up the debate is by saying, well, it means different things to different people. I think it's actually quite simple. So and I have to interrupt you because yeah. and you're such an experienced speaker. I know that it won't throw you off. Uh, they've asked me to have y'all move to the podium because they're having some sound system oh. issue. So if, would you mind moving to the podium? I figured you would, it wouldn't throw you off. So um, you want me to go so, again? No, you don't get to go again. <laughs> Absolutely not. Good try, though. The problem I have with these podiums is that I'm five foot tall and the microphone, that microphone is like poking my eye out. Okay, I'm good. I'm right there with you. <laughs> can I have actually my watch so this way I can you at least keep on the... So let me explain what net neutrality is. Okay, first of all, net neutrality is not about regulating the internet. I think that's really important. It's not about regulating the content, services, and applications that make up the internet. It's about regulating the on-ramps, all right, the ISPs that provide the on-ramps to the internet to ensure that they don't pick winners and losers. Right, so we, we, we come from a world of broadcasting and cable casting where the network owner gets to determine who wins and who loses. Cable operators determine who gets on the digital tier and, and with the exception of broadcast channels, who gets on what channel? Who gets channel 500 as opposed to channel 100? We all know about broadcasting and, and how they control content. The thing about net neutrality is it levels the playing field. So the smallest business can compete you know, with the largest media company in the way that their bits are carried. So it's not regulation of the internet, it's regulation of the on-ramps, and that's important. <clears throat> the other important thing to remember is that prior to 2005, the Brand X case, these on-ramps were required to be non-discriminatory, okay? It was, this was, this was communications law from 1934 was if you provided the on-ramps to the communication system, you could not, for instance, you couldn't say, okay, Kyle, we're going to give you the best quality phone call, but Gigi, we're going to, you know, make sure your phone call comes out fuzzy or we're going to block your call. All users were treated, treated equally. So this, so the radical change is what happened in 2005 when, when the Supreme Court said, okay, FCC, you know, you can unregulate the on-ramps to the internet. So I think that's an important thing to, to remember. So my three very quick points about why conservatives should like net neutrality. Number one, net neutrality promotes individual freedom. Okay, the founders of the internet wanted the internet to be, to have the control at the ends. They wanted the user to be in control. They didn't want anybody in the middle to be in control. So again, it ensures that, you know, somebody who wants to start a business on eBay and make a living that way you know, can compete against Nordstrom's or Neiman Marcus, right? Neiman Marcus can't pay, under a net neutrality regime, can't pay the ISP to make sure that their website comes up faster or without jitter, as opposed to, you know, how the small eBay person might, might operate. So, so it really levels the playing field and, again, promotes individual freedom. Secondly, it's a check on market power. Now, we can have a debate, and we will, about whether the broadband market is competitive. I think for the most part, we've got a regional duopoly in this country, uh, telephone and cable. Obviously, that's not true in big cities like this. There's 20% of the country that only has a choice of one broadband provider, and there is 10% of the country that has a choice of no broadband providers. But that, to me, is not the problem, okay? We can debate about that. I, I think I'm right, but we can debate about that. But what's not debatable is that each ISP has a termination monopoly. Now, what does that mean? That means that if I'm the small eBay business person and I want to make sure all Comcast customers get access, equal access, equal access is not the right term, but whatever, good, good quality access to my, you know, to my business, the only way I can do that is through Comcast. I can't do that through AT&T. I can't do it through Verizon. And that's what's really important. So if you want to reach the customers of a particular ISP, the only way to get there is to that ISP. And if that ISP decides to 
promote, you know, make sure that Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom bits have better quality of service than I do, I'm screwed. There's nothing I can do about it. There's no switch I can make. Right? It, would, it would be up to the other person to make that switch. So even if there weren't high switching costs, so on and so forth, so forth it doesn't end the termination monopoly. Very, very important. The third, and I'm going to really leave this for Marvin to talk about more, is you know, <clears throat> net neutrality is great for economic growth, and not just the economic growth, growth of the applications providers. I mean, there's really no debate that you know, Google has profited from an open internet, Skype has profited, eBay, Yahoo, but also it profits the networks as well. Not only in that you know, they have their own applications and their own content and their own services, but as the internet grows, an open internet to the extent that it promotes the use of more applications and the creation of more applications, that means more people will adopt broadband and that benefits everybody. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a zero sum game that it's either the applications providers who win or the networks win. Both of them can win under an openness regime. Now I want to very, very quickly respond to just two points. I'm going to leave the constitutional stuff to Marvin. Number one is, um, I hate, it's so hard to call you Commissioner McDowell, but I will call you that because I'd love to call you Rob instead. Regulatory certainty, you raised that. I actually think that net neutrality rules will give the network providers and the applications providers the regulatory certainty that's been lacking since 2005. Right now we're in this world where maybe the Comcast case decision is going to be overturned. This was the case where the FCC told Comcast that it had to stop blocking BitTorrent or, or, or you know, throttling BitTorrent. I don't know if you're familiar with that. We can get into that in the Q&A. But right now we live in this kind of nether world where we don't know who's enforcing what and whether these principles are enforcing any, you know, we're actually able to, you know, use these principles to enforce. So having rules will actually create regulatory certainty. And again, I think that's good for everybody. The second point is statutory authority. And I know you want to ask a question about this, Judge Elrod, so I'm going to make a very, very quick point is that with regard to ancillary jurisdiction, there is nothing more in the wheelhouse of the Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit's ancillary jurisdiction uh, jurisprudence than the actions of a facilities-based provider who leverages their power over that system, okay, and its effect on broadcasters, other tele, you know, VoIP providers, applications providers. I mean, this is Southwestern Cable, right? This is, this is the case where the Supreme Court upheld regulation on cable operators that affected broadcasters. This is really very much the same thing. And, and you know, I, I read um, Comcast's brief in the Comcast appeal, and I was, it was an excellent brief, but the fact of the matter is, as you admitted, Brand X itself says that the FCC has, you know, broad discretion to regulate uh, ISPs. Now, if the question is, as you say, whether these regulations will be more onerous than common carrier regulation, let's have that debate. I, I probably agree with you, they shouldn't be more onerous. I'd love to go, I'd love to just stick everything under Title II and go back to common carriage. I don't think that's politically feasible. But if that's where we are in the debate, let's have that debate. But that's a different question as to whether the FCC has the power. And I do think between Southwestern Cable, the CCIA versus FCC case, Brand X itself, and this brand new case, which I believe Judge Santel wrote, the ad hoc telecommunications case out of the DC Circuit, makes it very, very clear that the DC Circuit and the Supreme Court believe that when you're talking about facilities-based providers leveraging their power over their systems, that the FCC has ancillary authority over that. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to hearing from David and Marvin. Thank <laughs> you.